Okay, I just started it. Oh, I have joined the meeting as an attendee. Okay. I'm going to hang up on us. Does anyone want to try the link to get in? I was hearing myself just as an echo, so it was working. <laughs> I tried the link, but for some reason, it I don't know where it's sending me to. It's not sending me here. Yeah, the webinar webinar ID number is correct because that's the one I just put in when I called. So Lita, can you send that to communications and ask them? Yeah, I will. Okay, is is that link working? The one, the invitation that I sent you, does that work to get in? It works, it's just, it's not putting me in there. I don't know if it's because I'm already in and I need to be somebody else. So um, let me see if communications, is there any, maybe Matt can click on the link or somebody that's working right now? Yeah, let me call him. In the meantime, I'll send this, I'll forward this to communications. I mean, we do have the public access through the, the phone call because that is working. But hopefully they can work out the link as well. I just received an email from Teresa from communication. She says the link is working. Matt just said it's invalid. <laughs> Boy, uh, I like Teresa's answer better. Yeah. Well, we know the webinar ID number is valid because I called in on the phone and I could hear us. So we know the phone works and it's possible that if you put in the webinar ID manually rather than trying to click the link, 
that will work, but I haven't been able to do that, I think, because I'm logged in. I'll I'm trying off. to log in from my personal email and I can't get it. It says invalid link. I'm still dealing with trying to join the webinar. Let me try again, stand by. Thank you. Sorry for the delay, everyone. Okay, I'm in as a attendee. Okay, so it's working. Let's, Yay. Let's, let's go with that. Thank you, Lita. You're welcome. Okay, Justin, we are working now. We're accessible to the public. Excellent. Let's call the meeting to order. And the time is 1219. Good to see everyone. Um, Jennifer, will you call the roll, please? Yes, Justin Delacruz. Here. Jim Hiding. I'm here. Tracy Lissage, you are muted. We'll come back to you because I think you're here. Yeah. Stephanie I'm Powell. sorry, I'm here. I okay, couldn't find thanks, it. Tracy. You're welcome. <laughs> thanks. Stephanie Patterson. Here. Phil Spiegel. Martin Williams. Okay, so we have four out of six members, so we have a quorum, Justin. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so members of the public may speak on any item on the agenda, um, and I will... I don't see anyone from the public, um, or if you're hiding, uh, please let Jennifer or type in the chat or let us know um, if you'd like to provide public comment at this time. Justin, we don't have a chat uh, because of our past Zoom bomb. Uh, right. But what the public could do is raise their hand and the only attendee that I'm showing is Teresa Ruano who works in communications at the State Bar. Okay. Uh, if Teresa has no public comment, we will move on to the chair's oral report. I have nothing to report, so we will move on to uh, section two, and it's the approval of the minutes from our last full meeting um, from June 25th, and uh, approval of minutes from our August meeting, which was specially set uh, to speak with our group facilitators. Um, so if you've had a uh, opportunity to review them, uh, we'll entertain motions to approve them. I'll move to approve them. Jim, can you second that? I can, I'll second that. Great, okay. Um, are there any objections to uh, approving these minutes? No. Seeing none. We need to um, roll call because it's virtual. No, okay, we'll do okay. it that way. Um, Jennifer, please call the roll. Okay, Justin Delacruz. Aye. Jim Hiding. Aye. Tracy Lissage. Aye. Stephanie <laughs> Patterson. Aye. Okay, they, we have a majority. Awesome, so the minutes are approved. Thank you, everyone. Uh, section three, staff report. Uh, recent developments is this the uh, I'll turn it over to Michelle. Thanks. Um, the most recent development is that we are down one staff member, one of our clinical rehabilitation coordinators left at the end of September. So we're in the process of interviewing um, candidates. We, we had the job posted internally for a week and then externally on different job sites. So we've gotten, we've actually gotten a good handful of um, of applications. So we're going through the interview process right now. Hopefully we'll be able to hire somebody um, in, in a few weeks. We've got interviews set up next week and then we'll see if we go to a second round. So I'm hopeful about that. Um, we also had a, a good group of candidates also submitting applications for the vacant positions on the oversight committee to fill Kelly Renasinghe's position. And Justin and I made a working group to review those applications. 
and we found someone who we, we think will bring some good experience and passion to our committee. We're um, not announcing the person yet because it's not approved by the Board of Trustees that will go to the board, hopefully at their next meeting, not sure if that will be on the agenda yet for their November meeting. But um, after that person is approved by the board, they can be appointed. Or if they're not approved by the board, we'll make another recommendation. And let's see, any questions on that? Um, Michelle, once you're done with your recent developments update, I'd, I'd like to discuss more potentially creating a sub uh, a subgroup or a subcommittee for board appointments from the bar just to vet candidates because as Michelle and I were having this discussion, we were wondering whether we should have board input in times past. There has not been um, or oversight committee input on um, the applications. And I think it might be helpful to have that just to make sure that we're covering bases and making sure that we have um, a well-rounded board. So, uh, but uh, I'll leave that for later if you have more to add. Um, I, have, I have other things to talk about, but not about this topic of oversight committee appointments. Since we just, I just brought it up, uh, I was wondering what others thought about so the state bar has, I think, six appointments to this committee. Um, every once in a while, someone resigns for one reason or another, and we have to fill that. Um, do we think it's worthwhile creating a subcommittee to help vet um, applications, um, understanding that ultimately the, the candidate must be approved by the Board of Trustees? You suggesting recruiting subcommittee or evaluating subcommittee? Uh, um, well, it could be both. Uh, I think that um, I don't think we have a ton of recruitment efforts. I know when this position was posted, I saw it on Twitter. Um, I think I probably saw it on Facebook. Um, it was probably posted, you know, on the website. But I think, like for my own. For my own experience, I had to seek this out and I came across it just by chance. So, um, you know, I think the more we advertise it and there's an opening and we know people who are interested and passionate about this work um, and who will be a benefit. I, I don't see a reason why we wouldn't, we could call it a board development committee. Well, I, I certainly don't mind giving input so that uh, people can know more about the candidates if I should know something about the candidate. Uh, so if that's what you have in mind, I think that'd be good. Sort of like a Jenny, pre-Jenny type of deal. But uh, whatever you want, I, I don't know. One thing I'll add about any subcommittees due to Bagley Keen, any group of over two people that meets has to have public meetings and the meetings need to be noticed. So I don't know. Aye, aye, aye. Well, we'll uh, just do part we'll just of do the oversight call. committee meetings that are scheduled or, or if there would be separate meetings for that, but just throwing that in the mix. I yeah, think we and, just and do BK buddies for this. And, just to um, add on to Jennifer, you'd have to post, like if they submitted your application, you'd have to post that as public. And, you know, I don't know that everybody wants all of their application information you know, post it as a public meeting. So that's why um, we recommend, it can be a subcommittee, but it shouldn't be more than, than two. So maybe you want the chair and one other member or something like that. Um, I think that's okay. Yeah, I, I envisioned having two people, uh, no more than two people uh, or two members um, on the committee. Um, it inc could include myself, but also, you know, I wanna encourage others if they want to be more involved, to be more involved. And I think Stephanie is uh, muted a couple times. So. I think this is a great idea. So that way we can kind of get more input from the members or the oversight committee members um, as well in terms of the individual who will potentially be uh, joining the oversight committee. I think that's great. Tracy, do you have any thoughts on this? I'm kind of thinking the same as Jim. I, I'd be happy to give input, but I, I mean, I if I asked and I know them, so I'm good either way. 
Um, sounds like a wonderful committee of you and Stephanie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I think that sounds good. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, do we need a motion to create the committee and appoint members, or can we just do it without? Laurie or Jennifer, do we need it to be a business item in order to make a motion? Yeah, I think if it has to be on the agenda, if you're going to do it that way, but I don't know that that's necessary. I think that the chair can appoint a subcommittee to to handle something, and and you could do it probably when it comes up. So I don't know that it has to be done right now, unless you're saying you're changing what you what what we're moving forward with right now, or this is for the future. I'm assuming this is for a future. I just yeah. wanted to bring it up just because we I know we had discussed you know whether or not the board should have input, and I think a subcommittee is perfect for that. Yeah. Could it be called working group instead of subcommittee? Or Lori, do you think that the naming of it doesn't make a difference? I, the name doesn't matter. It, it still will have to, you know, in terms of the number of people you could have on it or whatever, I don't think that affects it. But um, I, I don't know that there's need to take action on it right now because, you know, next time it comes up, then then um, Michelle can reach out, Justin, and you could, you know, create the, the, the subcommittee or working group at that time when we need it. That sounds good. Sounds good to me. Okay. Thanks, everyone. So, um, timeline by when the uh, person needs to be selected, or not selected, but um, the candidate needs to be um, considered. The current okay. person that that you're looking into. It it all depends on the board's agenda, uh, the board calendar for getting things on the agenda. So if if you would like the person approved sort of as soon as possible to get it on the November calendar, we have to be working on that right now and moving it forward. Um, if if uh, there's not a, a big hurry, then we would it'd have to wait till the next time the board meets. Would I think it would probably have to wait till the January meeting then. Okay, hey, that's all I had on that. Um... Michelle, uh, ad additional recent developments? I wanted to share with you all the, um, since we just finished a quarter, the third quarter of 2021, we got our satisfaction survey statistics in. And this quarter, our um, admin staff, Matt Adams, did some, some new creative thing with, with um, the quarterly reports that our participants are required. So when they fill out their quarterly reports, which is on an online form, it automatically gives them a prompt at the end, do you wanna fill out the satisfaction survey? So they could go straight to it. And so we had a much higher response rate this past quarter than we've had for previous quarters. And we still met our targets. So the response to the question of, if the information and services effectively and appropriately address my goals, 94%, said um, they agree or strongly agree. And then same thing, 94% agreed that overall they're satisfied with their LAP experience. So um, so that's good. Our, our, our benchmark was 80%. So we definitely surpassed the 80% benchmark. That's great. And I like the fact that uh, we have incorporated technology in order to allow individuals the opportunity to immediately complete their um, surveys to increase that survey response rate. I know that that was one of the things we wanted to do in terms of our strategic planning um, for 2020 to 2022. Okay. It was, it, I had a little bit of a hard time hearing you, but you're saying it was part of our strategic plan to, to increase access or to increase the participation in that survey? Increase the utilization or incorporation of the over the, sorry, I don't know why I'm not able to hear that well, but. In terms of our strategic planning, I know um, part of what we wanted to do, including incorporating more technology in order to increase utilization. Yes, yes, technology. <laughs> Even though we've had some serious problems with technology lately. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'm very glad that he was able to to incorporate that. Matt is always good with some like creative ideas, and um, I think that was all I had updates on. And actually, the the first business Lita is up first because she has some um, a presentation that she's doing after this, so she's also going to talk about 
of what she's been doing related to the strategic plan, of course, with outreach. And so um, we can talk about that more too on her business item topic about how, um, and any ideas to utilize technology differently there too. Any so, questions for Michelle? Okay, seeing none, uh, legislative update. The fee bill was signed, nothing different for LAP, no interesting update there. When do they start, and maybe Lori or you know, Michelle can help, when when do they start uh, developing legislative proposals for 2022? I mean, they, they they start really early. So, you know, once they get the current people signed, they start thinking about what they're going to request for the next year. So it's always kind of in process um, because everything has to be done by, I think if they if they really want anything considered, they have to get it to the legislature, you know, fairly early in, the, in 2022 for it to then be enacted and to actually happen in 2023. So I know it's kind of a vague answer, but I mean, it's it's kind of always an open, you know, calendar of, of thinking about what they'll start requesting for the next year. Yeah, I know they have to get their bills in in the third week of February or so. Um, so that should be, we should have some idea about what the bar is asking for, but that always changes anyway. So, um, but was just curious if there was any internal process that that needed to go to. But okay. at least we know now that through 2022, our funding will be the same um, with our $10 for active member, $5 for inactive, and $1 of the actives going to the other bar will still be all the way through 2022. Yeah, that's great news. It's mm -hmm. great news. Okay, um, let's move to item four and uh, outreach discussions item A, and that's Lita. Thank you. <clears throat> so outreach has been uh, going very well. As of today's date, I've conducted 63 presentations. Of those, 16 were at law schools, nine were for organizations, 15 were for bar associations, 16 were for government agencies, and seven were for law firms. Also, as part of our strategic plan, there are certain um, demographics that we're also supposed to reach out to. So of those 63, two were to immigration type firms or organizations. Three were in rural areas for bar associations. One was presented to attorneys uh, dealing with senior issues, senior attorneys. And three were for national origin, national um, organizations that I presented to. During this last quarter, I had actually four presentations that were canceled. One was in um, South Lake Tahoe. I was literally, it was the day before I had my bags packed, ticket in my hand, ready to drive out to the airport. And I got an email saying, oh, we have to cancel the fires on, you know, en route to our location. <laughs> so, um, you know, these past, um, since March of 2020, you just have to learn how to pivot because so many things can happen at the last minute. Um, another one that I, well, let me go into some other stats first. So as far as law students that I've presented to for up to this point throughout the year, it's been 731, which is I think a great number. And as far as my MCLEs, Normally it's attorneys, but it could be non-attorneys in that group. I've presented to about 2,400. So that's a, that's a nice large number there. When I'm still doing my quarterly new newsletters that come out through communications and admissions, my biannual emails that go out specifically to law students and barbicants, which are, that email goes out to over 25,000. And we have emails that are sent out to deans and register, registrars from communications, as well as all our social media, the Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, as far as social media posts, and then 
there have been videos that I actually filmed that have been posted not only to those three social medias, but also to Instagram. On Instagram, they only post videos. And I have 20 more presentations scheduled throughout the end of the year. And I already have four scheduled for 2022, which is great. The, I had one big um, presentation coming up this week and that was our law school, or state bar day. We had oh, almost 900 people registered for that. And unfortunately due to some technical issues, it had to be canceled. And I was really looking forward to that because in our last state bar day, we had 215 students that attended that, which represented over 29 law schools. So we probably would have had double that uh, amount if um, you know everything was working properly with our technology. But um, like I said, you've got to learn how to pivot, and you know things happen sometimes. So overall, it's outreach has been great. I keep getting positive feedback from people who are you know saying we love these presentations. We want to have more of these. You need to you need to let everybody know about it. And I said I'm trying my best to um, let every attorney out there know about it, every bar applicant and every law student. So that's basically my wrap up for this past quarter. Any questions? I have a comment. I wanna commend you for your efforts and for the great success. It sounds like you're having uh, with this, you know, 20 to present 2,400 lawyers and 731 law students. That's really good. That's really good outreach. And I was just wondering, do we track how do we track the connection between people who are coming into the LAP program or whatever into recovery of some nature or going to their mental health practitioner uh, after the, you know, as a result of the presentations? Is there any way to track that? Like I went to uh, this seminar by Ms. Abella and I, you know, that made me decide to do X. Is there any way we track any of that? We don't have any tracking for if people do any other kind of recovery, but when they do come into the LAP, we ask them how they were referred. And so um, when we have our end of the year stats out, it'll say how many said from presentations who came to Great. the LAP after that. Right. Well, anyway, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I second that. And I also um, appreciate the emphasis on law students because I know that when I was in law school, I don't recall any of the services being available, including the career counseling component. So I do want to just go ahead and thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. I appreciate it. Lita, you are busy, busy, and uh, really appreciate your work. And I feel like every meeting we sing your praises and it's well deserved. Um, this time's no different. Um, 20. 20 more presentations before the end of the year. You're just really busy. I might add another one for uh, for my agency, but I'll talk to you offline for that. Um, so um, thanks so much for your hard work. And uh, any other questions or comments for Lita? I will just say the reason usually Lita gives um, her update as part of the staff report, the reason we put it as a business item, as you saw when we were talking earlier, is because in order for it to be, if anyone wants to make any suggestions or has any ideas or things that you want to talk about and we need to make motions about it, we would need it to be a business item. So that's why it's here. It's, of course, Lita is doing great and probably has enough to, to keep her busy at least through the end of the year or through our next meeting. But if anybody wants to talk about ideas that you've had or different outreach ideas or different ways to use the technologies that you might have come across. We, every once in a while, like the Poll Everywhere software, we come up with things that Lena's been able to use um, really effectively. And it was just because somebody saw it in somebody else's presentation and brought it up to us. Well, let me ask this. Uh, is there anything that you would suggest that you need uh, for, you know, you were talking about rural presentations, for example, you've done three and, uh, you know, there are a lot of there's a lot of distance out there, and a lot of a lot of little bergs, bergs throughout the state that don't get touched sometimes. So, 
I don't know if we can do outreach to them uh, through the remote channels or not, or what I just would like to know if you have any suggestions or requests that you feel would facilitate your, your uh, work. And does I the other bar support you good enough? You know, I have good connections with the other bar. So uh, tell me if they don't support you well enough and I'll make sure that I kick them in the rear and they, they do. The other bar? Um, well, I, I, a lot of times if I'm requested for a presentation and I can't do it because I'm already booked, I do refer them to the other bar. And I'm hoping that if the tables were turned that the other bar would also refer them to, to, um, to, to us so that I can present. I, I hope that we are working as partners in you know, getting the, the information out. Um, one thing I forgot to mention was that of, in the past quarter, I've presented three in-person presentation. So I'm starting to get more and more as, as the world is opening up. And, but, you know, doing it virtually has been great because I can reach more, especially the rural areas where normally people will never drive out there, fly out there, whatever. But a lot of the outreach that I'm getting, because I, I keep track of, well, how did you hear about our program? How did you hear about that I'm an MCLE presenter that I can conduct this free MCLE for you. And a lot of it's been because of the State Bar website, which we revised and through social media and the fact that I've presented for, you know, ABC Bar Association and they told XYZ Bar Association. And so then they tell somebody else and that's been great, great um, advertisement and, and marketing for us. Lisa, does, does the State Bar uh, do any posts every time that you do a presentation? They do like, advertise it if I'm hosting, which I've hosted seven since the beginning of the year. It's about every other month that I'm hosting and it goes out to you know every, everybody throughout California. If it's something where, let's say like, I think today I'm, I'm doing uh, Santa Barbara County Council or something, it's not usually advertised because it's only for that particular bar association that it's um, not that it's, um, well, it's usually just for, for those members. So, and, and some organizations where it's like the DA's office or something, we can't have the public because, you know, certain protocols and so forth. But the State Bar does help when I'm the one that's hosting and it's open to everybody. Okay. So any thank other you. Okay, any other questions? Doesn't look like any. Thank you, Lita. Um, so let's move on to item B, follow up on our discussion with the group facilitators um, regarding the benefits of continuing remote versus in-person. Um, I didn't think that there was any action to take on this, but my impression was the overwhelming majority of group facilitators liked the virtual um, option um, and reported back that the participants uh, preferred it that way too. Um, and uh, I think I also took note that it didn't seem to affect the services or their, um, I don't wanna call it treatment, but there's the services that were provided um, to the participants. So, um, that was, that, that was my impression. Others? I agree. I, I agree. And I also like the feedback from the facilitators who are saying that if things were to change currently, because they have been working so effectively at this point, lawyers, law students, state bar applicants, law clerks, that may engender some mistrust. Um, and I think that if it's working effectively and um, lawyers are, not lawyers, all legal professionals are still able to attend, I think this is this great. And I think something we really want to possibly can consider continuing. Tracy, do you have any thoughts? 
I missed that meeting. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> but I mean, it sounded like they were like they were happy with the virtual meetings. Yeah, and I think another thing to note is that they were really appreciative of the opportunity to be part of the meeting, uh, which also made me think, should we have like a standing item for group facilitators to bring up stuff? Um, and I'm sure they probably do that to you, do that with you, Michelle. Um, but I, I didn't know if anyone else had thoughts on that, or actually I should ask you first, Michelle, if you think that would be a good idea, because we definitely don't want to go around you because you know you no, are supervising. I think, I think they would really appreciate the invitation. That we had it on the agenda because last time when the group facilitators were there in case there were things you wanted to talk about without them being present, this would be an opportunity and to give, like because Tracy missed it, to give an update on what was said. Of course, you can, there's, um, a webcast somewhere. Is that what it's called? The recording of it is somewhere if anybody wants to watch it. Um, they do communicate with me if there is stuff that's going on and, you know, if there's information that we need to push out to the group facilitators, like, you know, have a group list of all of them can send it. But I think they appreciated being there and, um, and it, it was kind of, you know, a special occasion at this time, but it doesn't need to be. We can invite them. We can either make it like an annual every January type of thing, or just, you know, as we, as issues come up, invite them and aim for about once a year, if there's a topic that we want their feedback on. Yeah, I think uh, including them, you know, not having any benchmarks, but just, you know, if there's an item that we believe that's going to affect the group, like, I think that's, we should invite them. Mm -hmm. I think it would be good to have like an annual meeting i mean that we would specifically invite them for their input you know and celebrate their successes uh for the year mm -hmm. i also agree with jim um on the annual um benchmark because i think it's important to engage facilitators um to get their uh, insight on what is happening on the ground i agree too that's a great idea so do you think it would be useful to also include our group or I'm blanking on the name right now. <laughs> our clinical Oh the CRCs, the clinical the CRCs, yeah. coordinators. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you think it'd be uh, good to, you know, if we were gonna like say for example, we were gonna do an annual thing in our December meeting, um, do you think it would be good? I mean, because we should celebrate them too <laughs> and get their input as well. Again, I, I understand they, I'm sure they report to you any needs or issues, but you know, it would be nice to give them the opportunity to speak to us um, if they have anything they wanna bring up. So yeah, this sounds like, um, like an end of the year type of thing, like being able to celebrate the group facilitators, I think was the word you use, and like express appreciation to people. If we're meeting approximately quarterly, we might not have another meeting before the end of the year, but we can always bring like the holiday spirit into the beginning of next year and schedule it for yeah. January meeting. Yeah, that works. Kick off the, the new year mm -hmm. uh, on a positive note. Mm -hmm. Okay. Re spring renewal. Right. Sounds good. Okay, so that, that's something we could put on the agenda for January. Um, if there's nothing else on item B, uh, let's go to item C, feedback on the ABA Commission's uh, Lawyer Assistance Program's annual meeting. And this is for Jim and Stephanie. Well, I'll, I'll start, I guess. Um, I thought it was a great meeting. It was certainly energetic and enthusiastic with the participants. Uh, there was one meeting I especially like, I made all kinds of notes, you know, and, and I've got, if anybody wants any of the handouts, I got a mess of handouts. Uh, and they're, some of them are really informative and, and very good. But this one meeting that I really liked was uh, called On the Fringe or In the Mix. It's Attorney Wellbeing for All. And, uh, and the reason I liked it is because forever I've been trying to solicit the minority bars to 
participate in the recovery efforts, you know, and organize in recovery efforts. And so this one was a presentation that was organized by Raul Ayala uh, from Los Angeles. He's a Los Angeles federal uh, public defender and uh, does the drug court there. And uh, program ambassador was Derek LaCroix from, uh, he's from Canada, been involved in lawyer assistance programs forever. But some of the other the presenters were Elia Diaz Yeager, the president of the Hispanic National Bar Association, A.B. Cruz, the president of the National A Asian Pacific American Bar Association, uh, Sharish Sarish Siddiqui, the president of the National Association of Muslim Lawyers, and Lanita Baker, the president elect of the National Bar Association, Colleen Lamar, president of the National Native American Bar Association, and Samir Mehta, president of the South Asian Bar Association of North America, as well as the LGBTQ plus bar uh, past president, Eduardo Juarez. And uh, I've presented to the National Bar Association at their national convention and, and uh, encouraged their activity. But this was really encouraging to see all of those presidents there and really getting on board with the idea of wellness, attorney wellness and outreach within their organization. So I was very encouraged. There, were, there was a lot of stuff that went on. There was a, a lawyer effectiveness factors panel that uh, talked about a focus on uh, four kind of factors that they felt predict performance in lawyers, uh, which are problem solving, advocacy, practicality, and communication skills. And uh, they translated all of that uh, into virtue oriented lawyering. So lawyering that uh, has virtue as a uh, base to it, uh, which was, you know, really kind of the the feeling of why you become a lawyer in the first place uh, that you sometimes lose, you know, in the hustle bustle of daily life and trying to make a buck and the big fight in court. So uh, virtue oriented lawyering, very interesting stuff. But I saw Stephanie was there. Uh, I attended the Al-Anon meeting early on and then uh, the AANAs and the and the welcome and I saw Stephanie was on it was I felt good to see that she was on board with the with the program as well so I'll defer to her. Great, so thank you. Um, and I just had an awesome time as well. Um, I also attended last year, and this year's theme was writing the LAP story: reset, recover, and renew. Um, there was really great information. One of the sessions that I particularly liked, as Jim mentioned, was the attorney well-being uh, for, for all. And one of the things that stood out for me was um, Lonita Baker, the president-elect of the National Bar Association. She talked about, um, or suggested rather, now we have to allow lawyers, um, law students, and other legal professionals to feel comfortable expressing themselves um, when they may be dealing with any mental health struggles. Um, and this is just a way of allowing individuals to be their authentic, authentic self. And she is an African-American attorney. Those of you um, familiar with some of the work she's done, she has taken on uh, many civil rights issues. Um, notable cases out there. And then in the legal profession, even in law school, we're often taught um, you don't ever want to show weakness. And I think that sometimes this can get in the way of just honest discussion um, and as it relates to mental health. And then there's um, other topics that came up in terms of we, during the yoga session, I was there, I think both, both days. The speaker mentioned how we have to have well-being um, in all areas of our being as an attorney, as a law student, as a state bar applicant, um, as a judge. And this ties into well-being and um, resilience. 
because we are whole people. And so, and with that being said, it's also important to understand um, other people's experiences and other people's lived experiences because it gives normalcy to um, the issues that people are going through. Um, and there was a lot of information, feedback. Uh, one of the lab attendees mentioned how uh, we need more open conversations. Um, and this is important as it relates to collaborating among within and across multiple organizations in order to help be, bring individuals from the fringes to the forefront. People should not be suffering in silence. People should not have to deal with depression um, as lawyers or law students, simply because they don't want their colleagues to know or because it may appear that it's some sign of weakness. So there needs to be um, um, more done in terms of reducing stigma as it relates to mental health issues and substance use disorders in the legal profession. Um, and I think that um, these conversations are very important. Other labs also talked about um, what they're doing in terms of incorporating technology, like our, um, like what we're doing here in California. But technology, of course, like Michelle uh, mentioned previously, it's not always perfect. But I think the silver lining in all of this is that we have to be grateful that this pandemic hit at a time we are connected um, through technology. Otherwise, we would be in the dark ages, not able to interact with people. Um, so that's kind of uh, what I wanted to talk about in a nutshell. Let's see if I'm missing anything. Uh, um, while you're looking at that, there's they formed a couple of the people who were instrumental in getting the the uh, survey done with the Hazel and Betty Ford Center and the ABA have now formed this business or it's a nonprofit called the Institute for Wellbeing in the Law. I don't know exactly what all of that leads to, but I'm sure it will be dynamic and, and uh, create a lot of publications and that sort of thing. Institute for Wellbeing in the Law, IWIL. But the uh, goal, I think, of the whole program it seemed to me was this one phrase encourage help seeking behaviors and so uh, if we can do that in all forms and all uh, peoples you know that's that's what we should do i think i agree that's a, um that's a great point um and so Oh, oh, another thing that, that I think is important too, other members um, from other LAP um, labs shared positive feedback received after they sent um, well-being care packages. And inside of those care packages were things like um, cans, hand sanitizers to um, legal professionals to show that they were supported, not just um, on paper, but um, they put some meeting be meaning was put behind um, that support um, in the form of appreciation. Um, and um, there was another well, there was another session that had to do with law students. And it talked about the importance of having wellness coaches. Wellness coaches can, to some extent, help future lawyers learn how to appropriately deal with failure or mistakes and setbacks in a, pro, in a productive way because we're not gonna always win our cases. So um, we have to learn how to deal with those issues uh, in a positive way. So that's um, my takeaway from, in a nutshell, from um, the most recent collab. Well, thank you, Jim and Stephanie. And it's amazing that you're able to take so much, I'm assuming this is all virtual, um, yeah. in a virtual setting. Um, I guess that makes it easier for access. Um, and I remember to the, the one collab that I was able to go to, you know, with a, a bunch of uh, other oversight committee members and staff was a great experience. I'm hoping that next year uh, we have the opportunity to do that next year, because I think it's, it's amazing to connect with people in person who are doing this work 
and to get ideas um, from them. I think that's it's it's a, a just an amazing event. And thanks for thanks for attending and representing us well. Thank you. I was just going to make a really quick comment. I also uh, attended along with other people from our office. And um, I remember seeing Stephanie at seven in the morning. We both were in yoga every morning, <laughs> which is great to, to open up the, the day with a morning stretch of, of yoga poses and so forth. And Jim, you mentioned the Institute on Wellbeing or the, the yeah, yeah. Institute on Wellbeing Task Force. So Michelle and I, Michelle's been on it a lot longer than I have. I just joined, um, I think about two meetings ago, but it's, that's uh, people from all throughout the United States and they're putting a lot together and I'm real excited about being part of that uh, program. So I see a lot of great programs that will be coming in the future with that. But I, I thought the co-op was, was awesome. And I agree with you, Justin. I can't wait for next year if we can, I think it's an estate that we're allowed to go to. So that um, scheduled to be in Washington D.C. Yeah. to to is that a state open enough again to go there? But yeah, it it was supposed to be in D.C. this year, and then they ended up doing virtual, and so they'll have it there again next year if we're able to do it in person. Thank you. Hey, any other thoughts uh, or comments for Jim and Stephanie? All right, seeing none. Uh, let's move on to item D, the Attorney Supervision and Assistance Redesign Project. Lori. Hello, everybody. So I wanted to update you on this project. And I know Jim is on our steering committee. and We haven't had a meeting for a while. And really, it's uh, because it's, it's, an, it's such an involved project that as we, we tackle these individual pieces, they, they, they're taking longer than we had anticipated. And, you know, it's really a project that's really in the weeds, quite frankly. So what we've been working on a great deal lately is working with the state bar court to redraft what the probation conditions language will look like. Um, our original goal was to um, give much more discretion to the probation deputies to be able to, um, after conducting a risk assessment, be able to then tailor the conditions to the individual respondents after they'd been met with and we determined what seemed to be the best conditions. The court has expressed some uh, reluctance to give that much discretion to the probation case specialists at this time. So we're kind of going with more of a compromise approach where the court will still order the conditions and but will work on some of the language in them. And then um, once we conduct our risk assessment, we'll go back to the court with something if it looks like an area was missed that our risk assessment is saying, um, if we add this, it will help the person be successful on their probation or, or more successful. Uh, but one of the areas that um, we, we are hoping that we're going to get the court to agree and, and is that instead of the court ordering um, specifics on conditions that involve substance use and mental health or behavioral health issues, is that the um, default will be to just refer to our LAP professionals. Um, if they see that there's an area that uh, the, the respondent needs help in, um, they, they're identified as having a substance use issue, We'll refer them to LAP and then the LAP um, professionals will evaluate and say, okay, this is what seems to be the best way for this person to handle um, this issue. What happens right now often and is, um, and no disrespect to the judges who do their best to, to pick the conditions, is the court might say, we think this person should attend two AA meetings a week. And, um, you know, we think it would be better if it's the LAP professionals working with the um, respondent to come up with recommendations like that. So we're hoping that that's going to be one of the big changes that we get in the conditions language, even if we don't get all the other things that we had kind of hoped for, at least at this early stage as we move this forward. Um, so we're still working on that. And like I said, you, you know, I don't know if anybody's drafted conditions and, and rules and things like that, but every word obviously matters. And as we go back through it all, we find, oh, we better make this more clear. We better make that more clear. So we've really been working um, quite hard on getting those conditions just right. Uh, one of the other things that we're doing, I might've mentioned this before, is we're going to be doing motivational interviewing training with our probation case specialists so that they can um, hopefully elicit more helpful information from the respondents who are involved in the probation process when they start the intake process so that we get more helpful information 
that can lead the probation case specialist along with the risk assessment to recommend uh, probation conditions that we hope will help address um, whatever issues got them into trouble in the first place and then help to craft the conditions that we might recommend to really help them be um, tailored to what this person will need to help them be more successful. So we just got everything approved to move, start moving forward on that training. And that should be, um, we're hoping to start it before the end of the year um, to get some of that training going. And one of the other things that we have that is um, in the final stages, hopefully to be approved um, for working uh, actually up and live at the beginning of next year, if we're lucky, is a probation portal that will have all of the conditions that a respondent has to um, comply with on a, uh, through their uh, My State Bar profile. They could go to this link, go to the probation portal. On there will be deadlines and reminders and what their conditions are and some helpful resource guides and things for them to be able to um, access virtually through this platform so that they're not still getting lots of emails and letters and things with all of this that it's harder to keep track of. But this will be a good place that they can go see everything on a calendar format or a list format so that they can see what their deadlines are and what's upcoming so that they can have um, help them to organize and stay more on top of their conditions so that hopefully they comply with everything in a timely manner. So those are some of the big, um, big pieces. Um, we're continuing to work on our risk assessment with an outside professional to help us with that piece. And um, that is going to probably spill over definitely into next year till we have a little more update on exactly what that's going to look like. Uh, so if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. I was curious, Lori, who this specialist you're working with on the risk assessment tool is? His name is Dr. Michael Baglivio. He's out of, um, I think it's the University of Florida. And he has worked on a number of risk assessments in areas, uh, I think particularly he did um, work in juvenile um, criminal uh, risk assessments. And um, so he's helping us to go through the data right now that we have on our respondents to see if there are um, commonalities amongst the data that we have that shows, okay, if you have this, this, and this, a respondent is less likely to be successful on probation. And so um, we recommend that you try and, you know, really focus in on them and help the, that group to, um, you know, with whatever intervention would be appropriate to help them be more successful. So um, it's, there's really nobody out there who's ever done this for a professional group like we're trying to do with our um, attorneys. So it's a little bit novel um, to try and find somebody to help us, you know, who is a risk, um, a data specialist in this area. Um, and uh, Dr. Baglivio has um, seemed to be, um, we, he was recommended to us and you know, when, we, when we did the interviews and then contracted with him, he's um, diligently working on this right now, still going through the data, just trying to see what risk patterns there might be um, that the data shows us. Yeah, I was just interested because I know that just as you mentioned that I don't think there's any, any expertise out there in this field and you know, that risk assessment tool, if it's not accurate, I mean, the treatment recommended could end up doing more harm than good, so. <laughs> Absolutely, and we, we certainly wanna also, and one thing that I, you know, is definitely impressed with, with Dr. Baglivio is, is he's talking about, you know, you, you have to be aware of implicit bias, right? You have to avoid bias in the, in the assessment. And so there's things that you, in looking at the data, you kind of have to consider everything to then make sure that the, what you're coming up with as recommendations is not including something that um, is, a, is making the risk assessment biased. So then we have to work to, once we have all the information, look to see that it's, it's a really an impartial way of handling it and taking out anything that is, um, might cause the risk assessment to um, have any sort of bias in it. So that's all being considered as we go through this. Um, we did look at some, um, you know, early on when we were starting this, we, we re reached out kind of everywhere to see if there was anybody doing any um, sort of predictive analytics in, in the, this area. And, and we did find that in, in the United Kingdom, they do some of this with um, attorneys, but they do it more with law firms. And what they do is they analyze um, like the attorney uh, bank accounts. And if they see certain things going on, then um, they worry that there's like a money laundering going on in that law firm. 
And so they, they have ways of using predictive analytics to look into something like that. But we didn't find anybody who was using it more on like an individual level to try and determine if an, a particular attorney was at risk of getting into um, to trouble. Um, other than Nova Scotia has some work they do on that, but, um, and their, their tools are pretty good, but they have such an ability to, because there's so few attorneys in Nova Scotia, they're able to really make it so personalized um, that uh, some of what they do wasn't necessarily feasible for, for California, but we've been looking at all these different options to see if there's any pieces of the different, you know, parts that other groups are using that we can use as we continue to create ours. Yeah, thank you for that. I just know, uh, you know, when I, I'm a public defender, as you know, and I worked in all the collaborative courts and those risk assessment tools are so key to um, getting the treatment regimen correct and determining accurate risk. Usually the tool is validated over time before it's put in place. So that's why I was asking more questions about it because I wasn't aware of any out there either. Yeah, and, and so we have a probation officer who is our consultant on the project as well, Brian Richard, who's up in, he's the chief probation officer for El Dorado County. And, and I, I certainly am no expert on this, but he's been trying to educate me over the past uh, year or so that we've all worked together. In. And what we're aware that nothing can be an evidence-based practice, right, until we actually have the evidence. So we won't have that for a few years, but what we wanna do is try and start using it so that it can at least be evidence-informed based on the, uh, the data that we, we do have. And then we'll be testing it out over the, the time to see if it holds up to, to actually hopefully um, be, be valid. And, and um, if nothing else, we'll be giving, we're hoping extra services and resources to our respondents. We, we don't anticipate we're doing something that is going to be sort of punishing as we recommend things. It will be, it looks like you have a problem with uh, managing your finances, so what, our risk assessment has shown is if you take a course in X, that might help you to you know, do better in that area and hopefully prevent you from getting in trouble in the future, right? Something like that. Um, and then of course, as we will track all of that data and see if those kinds of things help um, prevent that attorney from getting in trouble again in the future. I'm Thank you. I'm really inspired, Lori, to hear about the uh, motivational interviewing training um, that's um, in the pipeline. Um, I'm impressed with that because it is in fact an evidence-based practice. I use it currently and uh, as a psychiatric board certified psychiatric nurse practitioner. Um, it's, for those who don't know, motivational interviewing, it's a collaborative approach to take to help strengthen a person's uh, own motivation um, and commitment to change. So this is something that I use when doing, when interacting with my um, patients who have mental health needs to come together and determine what's going to help motivate them to improve their own situation and to improve their overall health and well-being. So I think this is great. In fact, maybe even a side note, um, in my doctoral uh, nursing practice uh, program, I incorporated motivational interviewing um, into my project. And it was, it was very successful in terms of improving a patient's um, motivation to help them adhere to their appointments uh, appointments so that was that was you know great to hear well thank you stephanie yes and our uh, the consultant i mentioned brian richard who is a probation officer um they do use that in their um you know the office that he runs and he he you know as you said he's a proponent of it he thinks it is helpful in getting um, people to find, you know, their motivation and hopefully to try and help them be successful. So we're hoping to incorporate more of it. And um, as we get everybody trained, we'll start to use the techniques that they learn and uh, hopefully help these respondents who want to try and, and get back to practice, no matter what their issue might be, um, to, um, you know, protect the public by putting it an active and, um, and honest attorney back in practice um, who will, you know, follow the ethical rules and everything like that. Um, so that's what we're working toward. Lori, how long is motivational interview training take? I mean, is it a course of three days or a week or what? So we're going to be doing, um, there's uh, some uh, in-person, they'll be remote, but in-person sort of live sessions and a number of e-learning courses. I think there's six e-learning courses that we'll be taking over a, a number of months. 
and then following up with the um, the sessions with the um, trainer that will be the live sessions to reinforce what's learned in the e-learning courses. So yeah, it's not just like a three-day thing or something like that. We're gonna try and really like um, spend the time hopefully to get into it. I know it's something that, that people have to continue to use and practice and things like that. But to start out, we're gonna do as much of like kind of an intensive as we can to, to get people immersed in it over a number of months. All right, uh, any other questions for Lori regarding the ASAR? Seeing none, and that was the last item on our agenda. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Before the motion, um, nope. I just wanted to say normally our meetings over the past 10 years have taken place in March, June, September, and December. And this year we had March, June, and then with the group facilitator meeting added, we had August and October. So Michelle, I don't know if you think the next meeting will be in December, or I, I don't know if you said something about January, but I just thought I'd tell everyone what the classic LAP quarterly schedule was, which was March, June, September, and December. Um, it's to have another meeting by December, we'd have to schedule really quick so we can post it and it gets busy in the holidays. Do you all want to try and do a December meeting or we want to adjust our schedule? How about if we stretch it out a little bit and do it in February and then we can get closer to where we were last year or the year before and start in February that way. What do you okay. think? That sounds good to me. Uh, I'm good with that. Because how many are coming out? I'm good with that. Um, we'll do the usual. We'll send out a doodle poll as it gets closer and find that, you know, give a couple of options to find when most people are available. And we'll include group facilitators and the CRC in the next one. Sounds good. Sounds great. What was the month again? Was it February or? Yeah. Thank you. All right, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make the motion to adjourn. I do. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, good <laughs> to see you all. Uh, well, if I don't speak to you before then, happy holidays and uh, have an excellent rest of the year. Same uh, to you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Justin. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.